702. <laughs> All right, so, so we'll get started. Hello? Okay, uh, we'll get started. Uh, welcome to the IMA Public Lecture. Um, thank you for coming on a, such a nice day outside, but I, I'm sure you're going to be uh, rewarded for coming here. Uh, my name is Padil Santosa. I'm the director of the IMA. Uh, before I start, I want to mention uh, a couple of future talks. Uh, we have four great talks lined up for next year. Uh, 2012, uh, some of you may know, is the 100th anniversary of uh, the birth of Alan Turing, one of the greatest mathematicians that ever walked the earth. We're planning to have a couple of events to uh, mark the occasion, including a lecture by Andrew Hodges. He's uh, one of the uh, authorities in, uh, uh, about the life of Turing. Uh, so we'll be receiving announcements about that, and of course check our website about public, uh, uh, the IMA about uh, future public lectures. So I'm pleased to introduce uh, tonight's speaker, Dr. Jeffrey Rosenthal. Uh, he received his PhD at age of 24 from Harvard under the supervision of Percy Diaconis. His first job actually was here at the University of Minnesota. He was here for about a year and a half, and then he was lured away uh, back to Canada. <laughs> Uh, and he's been at the University of Toronto since 1994 in the statistics department. Jeff is well known for his research in a branch of computational statistics called Monte, Markov Chain Monte Carlo. He's the author of three books and almost uh, 100 article, journal articles. His research is well recognized among the many honors he's received are um, the 2000 Premier Research Excellence Award given out by uh, the uh, province of Ontario. Uh, this is uh, an award given out to promising young researchers by the Ministry of Economic Development and Innovations. He was elected to the Fellow of the Institute for Mathematical Statistics in 2005. Uh, he received the CRM SEC Prize in 2006. This prize is given jointly by the Centre de Recherche Mathematique and the Statistical Society of Canada and recognizes the accomplishments of statistical scientists during their early career. And the 2007 2007 COPPS President's Award given annually by the Committee of Presidents of Statistical Sciences Society to a person under the age of 40 in recognition for outstanding contribution to the profession of statistics. So he did all this and he also had time to write a very uh, a best-selling book called Stuck My Lightning which is being sold outside. If you bought a copy and you'd like him to sign your, uh, your copy, please uh, come, come down after the lecture. About this book, the publisher swiftly wrote, Statistics and Probability Made Fun, Easy and Useful to, for Everyday Life. Rosenthal ju just, does just that by explaining common uses of statistics. The lighthearted presentation ensures the reader will not feel burdened by all the knowledge that they are uh, gaining. And the concluding summary, this, this guise as a final exam, is sure to deliver an A to everyone, <laughs> which is what Rosenthal deserves for writing this very clever book. So uh, today's lecture is partially based on this book, and I think you will enjoy hearing what he has to say. So without further ado, uh, please welcome Professor Wilson Paul. Thank you very much and good evening. Uh, first of all, how's the microphone doing? Everyone hear me okay? Great. Oh, that's great. Fantastic. Um, okay, so, uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk about things related to probability and randomness and uncertainty. And um, some of it, as you said, will be related to my book, which is sort of about probabilities in everyday life and how they come up in different ways. And then I'll try to tie it in with things related to my research work, too. So we'll see if we can uh, put that all together. Um, and it's great for me to be here, so thanks for coming out and thanks for having me. And as was mentioned, I um, actually taught here and lived here for about a year and a half, some years ago, so it's, uh, it's a pleasure for me to be back. So um, I'm going to talk about quite a number of things uh, related to probabilities, but to start off, um, I'm going to talk about a few things that are small probabilities or that are unlikely to happen. And the one that I just kind of have to start with, because you know, when my book came out, I was doing a lot of media and so on, the, the number one question I got asked more than any other was about the chance of winning the lottery, right? <laughs> so somehow everybody said, oh, you're in probabilities. You know, what about lotteries? Hey, I bought a ticket. And, you know, do you think I'm going to win the jackpot? And so on. Um, so, you know, there's so much hype. You know, I, one time I remember there was an especially high lottery jackpot in the Canada where I live. And I did a total of 13 TV and radio interviews in a single 24-hour period leading up to this draw, right? So everybody wants to know, hey, what about these lotteries? Well, 
what can you say? You know, so um, let's take a lottery site to look up what lotteries are popular here. I think you got the, uh, the Mega Millions, right? This one is the national lottery that probably some of you have played. Right in the title, it sounds like you're going to win, right? Because millions, right? Um, so then you say, well, what can you say mathematically? Well, of course, one thing you can do is kind of work out the probability of winning the jackpot. So if you think something like the Mega Millions, well, how it works, as you probably know, at least as well as I do, is you have to choose five numbers between 1 and 56, and then choose another number between 1 and 46. So your chance of winning the jackpot is 1 over all the different ways that you could have made that choice, which is, you know, the number of ways of choosing five numbers out of 56 numbers multiplied by choosing that one number out of 46. And it's easy to work this out, and it works out to, oh, one chance in 175 million 711,536, right? Now, this is something, you know, it's easy to work out, and in fact, they'll even tell you, I think they have to tell you what the probability is. But then people say, well, you know, I know the probability isn't that high, but I think maybe I'm going to win, right? <laughs> And people think, you know, they, they have a chance. So, um, so let me say, well, how can you try to um, put this in context for people? So I've always asked about that, you know, how can you understand that? So, so compared to this, you know, this, we've got one chance in 176 million, what else can you say? Well, it is, compared to that probability, it's more likely that you will be killed by a bolt of lightning within the next two weeks. <laughs> Which is very unlikely, right? It's four times as likely that if you choose an American at random, that they will one day be the president of the United States of America. <laughs> um, if you choose an adult woman at random, then it's more likely that she will give birth to a baby within the next six seconds. <laughs> if you drive to the store to buy your lottery ticket, it's about 25 times more likely that you will be killed in a car accident on your way to the store than that you will buy the ticket. If you buy a ticket once a week, you will win the jackpot steadily at the rate of about once every 3.4 million years. So, you know, it's, it's a way to try to put it in context and say it's just so unlikely. It's just, you know, if you enjoy buying a ticket and dreaming about it, that's great. But just don't even think about, you know, what's going to happen when you win because it's just not going to happen, right? So, so it sort of puts things in context. But then when I say that, people say, you know, you're kind of a party trooper, right? Because everyone who's enjoying the chance they're going to win, and then I say, well, it's so unlikely it's not going to happen. But the reason I bring it up is because there's lots of bad things which are also very unlikely. So if we say, you know, how unlikely is a jackpot? We kind of said, oops, but uh, many bad things are also unlikely. And if you understand that, that can be helpful too, I think in probably a good way. So let me, start with, let me tell you a story. This is a true story. Um, it's back when I was a graduate student. And I was scheduled to fly to, fly to, to John F. Kennedy Airport in uh, New York City to visit some relatives. And exactly one week before my scheduled flight, there was a plane crash at John F. Kennedy Airport in New York City. And 73 people died. And my initial reaction, probably like a lot of people, was, well, holy smokes, I, I gotta cancel this trip, right? I can't fly in one week after this accident, or, you know, maybe I can take a train instead, or, you know, if I, if I have to walk to New York City, but, you know, I'm not gonna take this plane. And then, at the time, I was working on my PhD in probability theory, right? <laughs> so then I thought, well, is there something that I can say that's even more, more useful about that? So, I mean, the first thing to say, which is kind of a cliche, but it's true, is that, Commercial airplane travel is a safe way to travel, right? And you can look up the statistics that it's only about one commercial flight in five million which has an accident which involves fatality. So, you know, it's a small probability, kind of like these uh, small probabilities we're talking about. And you can say, you know, it's really just not something to worry about. But then you can say, well, wait a minute, but this accident was at that same airport, John F. Kennedy Airport. Well, first of all, I looked it up, and there's actually over 5,000 flights a week into this one airport. So it means even if I knew for some reason that there's going to be another crash at the same airport within the next week, there's still only one chance in 5,000 that it will be on my flight. So even that is pretty unlikely. But then another way to think about it is, well, there was no evidence that the airport itself was at fault in this crash. So what it meant is that the fact that there had just been a crash at this airport didn't make it any more likely or any less likely that my flight would crash. They're independent events, right? So um, you know, it's kind of like that old joke about the the guy who was afraid that the terrorist would bring a bomb onto his airplane, and his solution was to bring his own bomb onto the airplane. <laughs> and he figured it was astronomically unlikely that there would be two bombs on the same flight, right? 
So, so of course, if you have a bomb, it's independent of whether or not the, the bad guys have a bomb. And similarly, the fact that this one flight had, had crashed was independent of whether or not my flight would crash. And that was actually enough to convince me. So I flew to New York and scheduled, everything was fine. And, um, you know, um, so they tell people the story, and they say, well, you know, it's great to have all these statistics and numbers, but does that really help when you know, you're flying and, you know, you're going to be a little turbulence and you get a little scared? Does it really help having all these numbers? And my attitude is, yes, it does help if you really stop and understand what the numbers mean. That is, if it's in one year and out the other, it won't help. But, for example, in my case, I really stopped and thought about it. And, you know, I used to be kind of a nervous flyer, and I'd be, you know, checking to make sure the room was still attached and all that stuff. And, and now I, I'm just not, you know. And if you really want to worry about something when you're on a commercial flight, worry about it being late. Because a, over a quarter of commercial flights are late. That's a smart thing to worry about. But worry about a crash you just shouldn't worry about. So, um, okay, so that's a bit of a uh, way that I think about those kind of things. Um, we can talk about other things too. So let me just do some talk about, for example, um, homicides. And, um, so, you know, as you probably know, for the most part in this part of the world and in my part of the world, you know, the homicide rate is not very high. Things are generally pretty safe. And in fact, the rate of homicides and other violent crimes still has been gradually decreasing, not increasing. And yet, um, people tend to forget this a lot. And um, I follow the media more in uh, Toronto than I do here. So let me tell you a little bit about the kind of media things you hear about. And these are from Toronto. But, uh, you know, for example, um, a few years ago, there was one summer in Toronto when there was a little bit higher than average number of homicides. And boy, did the media go to town with stuff like that, right? And again, I can't say here so much, but so here's some quotes. So, you know, there's been a slight increase in the, the homicide rate. The newspaper said things like, Toronto has lost its innocence. They said, guns were used to bathe Toronto in blood. They said, they said gun crazed gangsters terrorize at will. They said people were tripping over police tape and bullet riddled bodies on their way to work. <laughs> so, you know, and these are the kind of things that you hear from media and from politicians and from police and so on. And um, when this happened in Toronto, again, my book had come out, and you know, I started checking the numbers a little bit, and first of all, Toronto had a lower homicide rate than a lot of American cities, and that, you know, of course, we always like to think we're safe in Canada, right? So, so that wasn't so surprising, at least to convince people there. But, you know, Toronto also, even in this year with an elevated homicide rate, had a lower homicide rate than quite a few other Canadian cities too, even though that wasn't the impression we got from the media. It even had a lower homicide rate than Toronto itself had had a few years earlier, but everyone had kind of forgotten about that. And then it turned out, and this I had to check the figures twice so you couldn't believe it, during this year of elevated homicides in Toronto, the homicide rate for Toronto was lower than the homicide rate for Canada as a whole. So then even while I was saying Toronto is this big, dangerous city, it was actually safer if you were in Canada to live in Toronto than to live outside Toronto, right? Um, so since I was coming here, I looked up some similar facts for uh, Minnesota. And um, so, uh, well, let me so first thing say is that Minnesota also has quite a low homicide rate. In fact, let me give you the biggest compliment I know how to give. Minnesota is almost as safe as Canada. <laughs> it's it's uh, got a low homicide rate, and so and in particular, it's also decreasing. So if you look, say, every five years, and well, in 1995, there were 182 homicides. In the year 2000, there were 151. In the year 2005, there were 115. In the year 2010, there were 96, so it's gradually decreasing. If you look at the rates per 100,000 people, which is another way to say it, it's also been uh, this uh, gradual decrease. And uh, I say, I haven't followed the media in Minnesota, but I would imagine that at times when there's a high-profile homicide, people start to say the same things about how dangerous it is and so on. And I can't say for sure, but probably they do. And if they do that, you know, you should always be a little skeptical because actually these things are decreasing. And, and so, I mean, I, I could say more, but I'll leave that at that. But I'll just say other things that come up. So, you know, you hear about a horrible child abduction or a home invasion or some really grisly thing. And of course they're horrible, and of course we should, uh, we should be concerned about them. But you should keep in mind that the reason they make the headlines is not because they're common, but because they're so rare. Right? And in fact, uh, you know, sort of what else I always call a, um, a headline bias, right? That's always come up because they're rare. You know, there's not a headline, old man dies of cancer, because it happens a lot, right? But there's a headline, horrible home invasion, because it's an especially busy rare thing. So, um, and in fact, you know, if you want to put things in perspective, well, by contrast, some things are not so rare. So over a third of Americans will eventually die from cardiovascular disease, right? Strokes and heart attacks and so on. And you know, one of the risk factors for cardiovascular disease is stress and worry, right? 
So it means probably more people die from worrying about these uh, very unlikely events than are actually killed by these unlikely events. So it's a way to put things into perspective a little bit. And it doesn't mean they're unimportant. It doesn't mean we shouldn't, uh, shouldn't have compassion and so on. But it does mean that we should understand that the risks are just not that high. So we're not going to win the lottery. We're also probably not going to be killed by terrorists, not going to die in a plane crash, not going to be killed in a homicide, and so on. So, um, Okay, so let me, uh, let me move on to that. So, yeah, just saying, don't worry so much. And also, don't believe the hype when people say things about how dangerous it is, even when it probably isn't. Or, for that matter, when people will say they're probably going to win the jackpot. <laughs> you shouldn't believe that either. Um, but let me move on to some other topics. So, I want to talk a little bit about uh, casino gambling, partially because I'll try to tie it in to some other things later. Um, so, casinos, you know, it's so sort of interesting. I always find it interesting with casinos that, um, you know, when someone proposes to build a new casino, there's often, there could be controversy, right? Because, you know, is this a good idea? Is this a bad idea? Will it lead to gambling addiction? Will it lead to, you know, crime? Will it reduce uh, the quality of the neighborhood? But no one ever says, let's not build this casino because I don't think it's going to make any money. <laughs> And if you think about it, that's kind of a strange thing, because any individual who goes to the casino, they might make money or they might lose money, and you know, sometimes it's up and sometimes it's down. So how are we so sure that the casino is always going to make money? So to think about that, saying, well, why do casinos always make money? Let me consider, first of all, a specific casino game that you're probably familiar with, the game Craps. Right? So you repeatedly roll a pair of dice, and it's got these kind of funny rules. If the first roll, if the sum of the dice is a two or a three or a twelve, then you automatically lose. If it's a seven or an eleven, then you automatically win. If it's some other number, like let's say it's a four, then you keep on rolling until you either get um, another four and then you win, or, or until you get a seven and then you lose. So it's kind of these strange rules, right? And why would they have such strange rules for a casino game? Well, we can say, you know, why is that strange rules? Well, when you work it all out, all the ways you can win if you roll this or you roll that, it works out to about a 49.2929% chance of winning, which, since you're all interested in mathematics, you all probably know is slightly less than 50%, right? <laughs> so the odds are just slightly, slightly against you. And all casino games have this kind of property that it's you know, pretty fair, but just slightly against you. So, so then you can say, well, what happens if you do this in the long run? So let me try, um, I'm going to, for the first of several times, try running a little simulation here. Um, let's see if this works. So, so this is just going to keep track of somebody's money, let's say your money, at the casino. And this black dot shows that you're starting with $100. So you got $100 at the casino, and you're going to bet $10 on craps. So let's see if I can get that working. So then it was the first time you bet, you have a 49.29% chance of winning and going up to $110, or else you go down to $90. And the computer will do this randomly with the right probability. So, oh, the first time you lost $10, right? Sorry about that, but don't worry, now you got $90, right? And now you get to bet again, because we're looking at the long run. So the second time you bet, oh, you lost again, that's not a good beginning. You're at $80, oh man, $70. Let's see if you can win once before I move on, oh man. You're the least lucky audience I've ever spoken to, I think. Uh, $60, okay, there you go, you wanted $70, let me get that running. So where is that running? So the point is, we're not in the long run, now you're down to $60, so you're on a bad run here, you're at $50. Um, Okay, <laughs> we, we might have to do this one over again. Um, okay, but the point is, they say, what happens in the long run? And in particular, the question that I want to address, although you're doing so badly, I might not have time to address it, is, um, man, I, I can barely watch this. This is... <laughs> <laughs> okay, that, that is the quickest I have ever seen this simulation end. I'm going to do it again, but before I start it again, let me explain that what I really want to talk about is if you start with $100, what's the chance that you'll get up to $200 first before you lose all your money, go down to zero? In this case, you went down to zero so quickly, I didn't even have time to pose the question, right? But, um, but let me try that again, and let's go a little slower. Maybe it'll be a little better this time. There, you're up to $110 to start with. And usually, this takes quite a while, because there's a lot of ups and downs involved. And now, now, you're, now you're suddenly on a huge winning streak here. I don't know what's going on there. 140. Wow, this is, it must be something in the Minnesota air. I don't know. This is, uh, this is not typical. Usually, there's a lot more back and forth going on here. 
<laughs> this is really amazing. <laughs> amazing. Congratulations. That was the quickest I have seen anyone lose and the quickest I have seen anyone win at this simulation. Um, usually it takes a lot longer. I don't know if somebody hacked my computer while I was out in the, in the bathroom, but we try for one more time, although the point I'm going to make will stand anyway, but the point is usually it's a lot closer, so we'll call this best two out of three, I guess. Um, let's see if it's a little more balanced. So, hey, man, you're just on a roll now. Anyway, the point is, even if whether you knew, how whether you knew good or bad, um, there's a question of what's the chance in general that you'll tend to go up from 100 to 200 before you lose all your money. And so it's a little different than the chance of just winning one bet, right? Because one bet, you have a 49.29% chance. This one, it's going to take a longer time and it has some ups and downs. At least it usually has some ups and downs. And, um, and then you say, well, what's the chance it's going to eventually double? Now, this is something we actually know how to work out this probability. It's called the gambler's room probability. But to me, it sort of illustrates the long run. Now, how are we doing here? This time, you're taking a more typical run and you're back somewhere towards the middle. Um, let's see what that can be used, which means normally I have to speed up the simulation in order to finish it. So I think I'm going to do that now. Let's go a little bit faster and watch your betting. This is the best two out of three now to see whether you get up to $200 before you lose all your money. And you'll see this is a little more typical. There'll be some ups and downs. It could take quite a while, right? Um, and in fact, you can keep track of the number of bets up there too somewhere. So you can see this time is taking quite a while and there's some ups and downs and you might win and you might lose. And what's the chance you get up to 200 before you lose all your money? You're doing pretty well though. Oh, you almost made it. <laughs> you almost made it. Oh, okay, there you go. Congratulations, you won two out of three. So at least that suggests it's not that unlikely. Um, let me, before I move on, let's try the same thing but when you start with um, $1,000. And the same question, but this time you're still betting $10 each time. But you're trying to get up to $2,000, so starting with 1000 So you can see it's going to take a long time now, because these little $10 bets don't even look that, that big here. So I'll run this a little faster. Um, so if you run it faster and faster, and again, you can keep track of the number of bets there. And you see it takes a long time, a lot of ups and downs. And you can say, well, now what's the chance, starting from $1,000, that you'll get up to $2,000 before you lose all your money? If you keep making these $10 bets, and each time you have a 49.29% chance, of winning. So this one is more typically taking a long time, so let me try to run this faster without doing super fast bets. We're up to 250 bets already, and you see a lot of zigzagging around as we do all these really fast uh, repeated uh, $10 bets. See, the overall, you're not doing that great. <laughs> you're gradually going down. And um, maybe I'll uh, do this a little quicker because it's taking a little longer. So anyway, super fast, you've done 3,000 bets, 4,000 bets, 5,000 bets, 6,000 bets. You're jumping all around, you're hovering around, what, about 500, 600? Oh, you finally lost. Okay, so after 10,750 bets, you lost your 1,000, right? Okay, so we'll come back to that, but um, let me um, talk about, so, so what's the point of this? The point of this is that um, we can look at what happens in the long run when we do repeated gambling. And if we look at this, I say, what's the probability you double the amount that you started with before you go broke if you keep playing craps and you keep betting $10? Well, if you start with $10, then it's just, you just get to make one bet. So you have a 49.2929% chance of winning, right? We all know that. What if you start with $100 like we just did? Well, it's not so small, which I don't have to convince you of because you won uh, two times out of three at that setting. So there's about a 43% chance. So it's a little bit less likely, but not too much less likely. But now suppose you start with $1,000, the chance you're going to get the $2,000 is about one chance in 18, about 5.5%. So the point is, as you bet more, it becomes much less likely. What if you start with $5,000? Start with $5,000, you have about one chance in 1.4 million of getting up to $10,000 before, uh, before you lose all your money. If you start with $10,000, you have about one chance in 10 million billion. Right? So what's the point of this? The point is, you know, if you make a few bets, you might win, you might lose. The more bets you make, if it's just weighted slightly against you, the more likely it is that you're going to lose more than you win. And in fact, this is related to what we call the, uh, the law of large numbers, as some of you may know. And it says that if you just make a few bets, you know, anything can happen. But the more you repeat an experiment, like making a bet at craps, the more the true probability becomes significant. And if it's weighted just a little bit against you, then over the long run, it's going to get you more and more. And this, this sort of thing comes up a lot. So for example, um, you know, when I drive, I sometimes get frustrated when I come to a red light and I think, you know, this, this light is always red every time I come to it. Right? <laughs> and, you know, people say, come on, haven't, haven't you read your own book? Don't you know that uh, there's a lot of large numbers here and that half the time that light's going to be red and half the time that light's going to be green and so on. Um, 
Um, yeah, so in fact, you can, yeah, you can say a lot more about this. Maybe I'll say, for example, the, um, you can think of this as the reason that the, the World Series isn't just one game, it's seven games, right? Because in any one game, well, any team can win, but the more games you play, the more likely that the team that's actually better is actually going to win more often. So same kind of thing, just like over the long run, the house has the advantage, the house is going to win in casinos. Okay, but let me make some connection. Oh, well, let me, let me say one other thing. Actually, I'll say a few more things about gambling because somehow it raises other questions. So one is related to, you can say, trends. And this says, suppose let's say you're at the casino, you're watching somebody uh, shooting craps, and let's say they've won five times in a row. Then some people will say, oh, you know, he's hot, right? He's on a roll. I'm going to bet that he's going to win because he's won five times in a row. Other people say, well, no, no, you know, it all has to balance out in the end. So if he's won five times in a row, he's probably going to lose. So I'm going to bet against him. But of course, those are both wrong, right? <laughs> There's probably some of you know. Every roll of the dice is actually independent. So um, the fact that somebody's won five times in a row doesn't make it any more or less likely that they're going to win on the sixth time. And people will get confused by that too. So you know, each bet is independent. It's not that the bet knows what happened on the previous bet. It's just that by the law of large numbers, the averages are going to um, the averages are going to uh, balance out in the long run. So. Let me say one more thing about gambling, and um, this is to do with a gambling strategy. And so usually I don't talk too much about gambling strategies, but some of you may know about this. And in fact, um, just uh, last year or something, I um, got an email from, from a grading teacher. And he said he, he, uh, he really, really might help, because he'd been telling his students that, you know, you shouldn't gamble because you're, you're on average you're going to lose money. And then he said this student in the class said, no, he has a way to always make money. And the teacher didn't know why the student was wrong, and the student was telling the other students, and it was starting to undermine their confidence in the teacher. Right? <laughs> so, so, and what he was talking about was what's called a doubling up strategy, or a double tell you win, or a martingale, and some of you may have seen this, but let me just quickly talk about it, because people ask me about it tonight. So it says, here's a strategy, you're going to play craps, and yeah, the odds are slightly against you, but hey, you want to win $10, here's how you can win $10, right? says, okay, go to the casino and bet $10 on craps. If you win, then you're up $10. You quit, you go home, and that's the end. So you see, I won $10. What if you lose? Well, if you lose, next time you bet $20. And if you win that time, well, you lost $10 the first time, but you won $20 the second time, so your net profit is $10. And now you have $10, so you quit and you go home. And continue. So if you lose again, well, you bet $40, right? And if you win that time, well, you lost $10, and then you lost $20, but then you won $30, so your net profit is $10. So you're up $10, and you go home. And if you lose again, just continue, right? So uh, eventually, you're going to win if you play craps. You can't keep losing forever. And as soon as you win once, then you're up $10, and you go home. That's perfect, right? <laughs> so perfect way to win $10. And uh, you know, if you haven't thought about this too much before, you say, yeah, it seems perfect. I'm going to rush out to the casino, right? But, you know, <laughs> Yeah, please wait until the end of the talk before you do that, because, uh, because uh, you know, let's talk about it a little bit. And um, let me um, talk about a smooth and concrete example to see where this can kind of go wrong. So suppose you say, yeah, I'm going to win $10 playing craps, and you go to the casino. And let's just suppose for argument's sake, because it will become clear in a moment, that you have access to $21 million. <laughs> now, you might say, if you're that rich, why do you care about winning another $10, right? But let's suppose you did, and maybe that's not what you have. That's just the maximum amount you can take out in loans and so on. That's the amount of bankrolling that you have. And then you say you're going to use the strategy of doubling until you win. Well, if you win the first time, you're up $10. Or if you lose and then win the second time, you're up $10. Or if you win the third time. If you win any of your first 21 times that you play um, at, at uh, craps, well, in that case, you're up $10. But suppose you lose all 21. So if you lose 21 times in a row, then you lose, what, you lose 10 plus 20 plus 40 plus 80, and you add it all up, you lose $20,971,510. So you lose a lot, right? And in particular, now you say you've lost all, essentially all of the 21 million that you started with. You can't continue to double up, right? You're out of, you can't take out a loan. You've, you've reached it all. So then you say, well, what's the chance of that? Well, the chance of winning each individual time you play craps is 0.492929. So losing is one minus that. Raise it to the 21st power. That's the chance that you'll lose 21 times in a row, which is about one chance in one and a half million. So it's very unlikely, right? But then you say, what happens when you put it all together? So you do this double tell you win strategy, you're betting $10 at crops. 
What's your net profit when you go home? Well, you can work it out. The net gain, so you win $10 all the time except this one chance in one and a half million, but then you lose $20,971,510 one time in one and a half million, and this works out to a net loss of $3.43. <laughs> so in other words, you'll probably win $10, but you have a small chance of losing so much that, in fact, your net gain is a loss. Um, and this is sort of always true. That is, in, unless you truly have an infinite amount of money that you can draw on, which nobody ever does, then on average you're going to lose. So I say that just for all the, uh, the grade 8 teachers out there who are being harassed by their students who say this is a sure way to win money. It's actually not. So, Okay. Um, let me talk about something a little different. And um, this is to do with uh, flipping coins, which is even more basic maybe than the casino. And um, it says, suppose you flip some number n of coins, then what percentage of them will be heads? And let me try to run just a simple uh, simulator. I'll sort this over, which, um, which just simulates, we'll start with 10 coins. And it says, hey, if I flip 10 coins, how many heads do I get? I don't know if you can, yeah, you can see that, okay, I'll move it up. So he said the first time it simulated is again man in the simulated tails, tails, heads, 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 tails, tails, heads, 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 which works out to six heads out of ten, or 60%, right? Well, let's see again. This time, this time we got five heads out of ten, or 50%. 50% again, 80%, 40%, 70%, 30%. So the point being, well, on average we should get about 50% heads. But we don't always get 50% heads, and our percentage could be quite a bit off. It could be 80%, it could be 30%, whatever. Um, what if we flip more coins? So suppose we flip, let's say, 100 coins. Well, here we got, what do we get? Tails, heads, 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 tails, heads, heads, heads. And when we put that all together, in this case, we got 58% heads. If we do the end, 54% heads, 59% heads, 44% heads. So the percentages of heads, they're still not exactly 50%. But they're getting a little closer, right? They're usually they're not as far off uh, from 50%. What if we flip 1,000 coins? Um, well, we get a great big sequence of heads and tails. And wow, in this case, they end up being 50.7% heads, 50.2% uh, heads, 50.4% heads, 50.7%, 48.2%. The point is these percentages are getting closer to 50%, right? So, First of all, that's another way to think of the, uh, the law of large numbers. It says, uh, just like if you keep playing your crops, then over the long run, the house is going to win a little bit more because it's in their favor. If you keep flipping coins, over the long run, you're going to get about half of them heads. But it says a little more than that because it says that you, you can start to see how when you flip more coins, we can quantify how close we'll be to being half heads. And um, let me... Um, let me try to say that a little more concretely. So yeah, the first thing we can say is that the bigger N is, the more coins you flip, the closer you will be to having 50% uh, of them be heads. But you can say more, and this is, I won't give all the details here, it's related to the, uh, the central limit theorem or the bell curve, but it sort of says we can quantify how close we will probably be to 50% heads. And one simple way to say it is that usually, about 95% of the time, about 19 times out of 20, we will be within a certain small percentage of 50% heads. And the certain small percentage can be computed as take 98% and divide by the square root of the number of times that you flip the coin. And that will give you a margin of error. So for example, if n is 10, then this formula works out to about 31%. And it says you'll be within about 31% of 50%, which really means you'll be within about 20% and 80% heads, right? So if you flip 10 coins, there's quite a range of percentages you can get for heads. If you flip 100 coins, the margin there is more like 10%, so you'll usually be within about 40% and 60% heads, which is what we saw when we did that little experiment. 400, the margin there goes down to about 5%, so you're within about 45 to 55% heads. A thousand times, the margin there is about 3.1%, so you're within about 46.9 to 53.1% heads. And that's the last one we did. And let's remember that figure 3.1 because we'll, we'll come back to it. But, um, and then as it goes higher, you know, 5,000, the margin there is about 1.4%. 10,000 is about 1%. So it means even if you flip, even if you flip uh, 10,000 coins, you'll probably be within about 49% and 51% heads. You still won't be probably exactly 50% heads. But we say, well, how does that help us? Well, it's related to a lot of other things. And one thing that's related to is to public opinion polls. And so I want to talk about this before moving on to, uh, to Monte Carlo things. And um, 
So probably you all, you know, we all hear about polls, right? Whether it's for something political or how many, what percentage of people believe this or support that or will vote for this. And um, sometimes they will also talk about how much uncertainty there is in their poll results, so a margin of error. And they, they don't always seem to mention that, but sometimes they do. So, so if you look at a public opinion poll where you choose n people at random, and you say, you know, how many of you agree with this, or how many of you support that, or agree that, and I thought, well, let's have a test uh, topic for tonight, let's say, how many people agree that mathematics is the best subject, right? <laughs> of course all of you agree, I'm not even going to ask, right? But, uh, but as, uh, as we ask the general public, well, what percentage of people would agree with that? Well, it's the sort of thing we could, we could poll, right? We could say, what percentage of people agree, or how many people vote for a certain candidate, or whatever. And um, the point is, it's kind of like flipping end coins, and each time we pick someone at random, and ask them if they support it or not, or ask them if they agree or not, it's kind of like we just flipped another coin. But the difference is, we don't know the probability of success. It's not a 50-50. Now the true probability is the fraction of people who would support that. But the margin of errors are still the same. So, for example, suppose we surveyed 1,000 people. I didn't actually survey about this question, but suppose we did. And suppose 726 of them said, yes, I agree, mathematics is the best subject. And the others did not agree. Then we say, okay, well that means that 72.6% of our sample agreed with the proposition. So we want to say 72.6% of the population agrees. But we just sampled 1,000 people and we're not sure how accurate that is. But the margin of error, we can use the same logic as we did with the coin flipping. And remember that we said with 1,000 uh, coin flips or 1,000 people, we had that margin of error of about 3.1%. So it means we can say that probably, according to, you know, this 19 times out of 20 margin of error, it's probably the true percentage is within about 3.1% of this 72.6%. So you can say, okay, probably between 69.5% and 75.7% of, of the whole population would agree with this statement. So we've only sampled 1,000 people, we have some uncertainty, and yet we're able to quantify that uncertainty. Um, so we can, you know, so everyone's opinion is based on a small sample, um, and one thing I'll say is that I say I think newspapers, um, as far as I can tell from checking, usually in Canada they will report the margin of error. When I checked some of the Minnesota ones, I didn't find it in all of them, so maybe it's not reported here as much. But the point is, often the newspaper will report the margin of error, and now you can check and see if they did it right. And uh, some people won't believe me. I'll say, you know, they must do something complicated. They don't just take 98 divided by the square root of n. Well. You know, in preparing this talk, I did a web search for Minnesota and margin of error, right? And uh, so, you know, do these papers really do this? Well, here's one thing I found. It's from a couple months ago. It's about the, the uh, Republican primary race. It's a little out of date now because uh, Santorum is no longer in the running, really. But anyway, it had a poll, and it showed, you know, Romney leading, and it checked both um, in Colorado and in Minnesota, and it went on to give various percentages. But one thing it said later on is it said, well, they surveyed 938 people in Colorado and 864 in Minnesota, and the margin of error was plus or minus 3.2% in Colorado and 3.3% in Minnesota. And, you know, probably you've seen things like this before, right? They're reported sometimes. And I would say, you know, what does it mean? Well, hopefully now we can understand what it means. And furthermore, we can check, right? So we can say, well, we thought that the formula should be, you know, 98% divided by the square root of n. So we take 98% divided by the square root of 938. And sure enough, it equals 3.1998%, you know, which is about 3.2%, which is exactly what they said. And similarly, if you take 98% divided by uh, 864, you get about 3.3%. So the point is, this is really all they're doing. So next time somebody says, hey, I read this poll, and hey, it says the margin of error, you can impress them by telling them the margin of error before they read it to you, right? <laughs> um, okay. Um, yeah. Let me think. So I think I'll... Uh, Maybe I'll skip. I was going to say something about how um, how you can use probability to make decisions. Um, yeah, maybe I'll, okay, I'll go ahead and say this. I'll just say it quickly. I'm just trying to think the timing. But um, people say, well, you know, probability can help you understand the world, but can it help you to make decisions about the world? And the point is it can if you think about things properly. And uh, so, for example, it was a classic case. You're wondering, you know, if you should ask someone out on a date, right? All of us at one time or another have, have been there, right? So, so you say, okay, well, can probability theory really help you with something like that? Well, I'll admit it can only help so much, right? So I don't, I don't want to oversell the, the point here. But the point is it's an example of how you can try to think about things in probabilistic terms. So um, you might estimate, you might say, you know, uh, based on what I know about this person and what I know about me, what I know about the society, whatever, 
let me try to estimate the chance that she's going to accept if I ask her out on a date, right? And maybe you, for whatever reason, you put it all together and you estimate that there's only a 10% chance, right? <laughs> so you're not feeling very optimistic. But then a lot of people would just leave it at that. Say, oh, well, you know, the chance is so small, so let's just forget it, right? But then you say, well, can you say anything more? And the answer is you can, so you, know, so you do it anyway. Well, you can try to think in terms of what's called a utility theory, which some of you will know again, and that's to try to how to put a numerical value on the different possible outcomes, right? So, um, so for example, you can give a utility function, a u value, to all the possible outcomes, and then try to use that to help you make a good decision. That's just supposed to represent how good or how bad that outcome would be for you. So, so let me say, well, let's see. If you don't ask it out, well, that's probably a zero, right? Nothing good, nothing bad, nothing really happens. What if you ask it out and she says no? Well, that's going to be negative, right? You're going to feel bad, it'll be embarrassing, it'll be humiliating. But it won't be so bad, right? So you have to have some sort of a scale. But maybe you say, well, maybe that's a minus 50, right? That would be a way to say, okay, you know, if she says no, that'll be embarrassing, that'll, that'll be awkward, that'll be bad. But then you say, well, what if she accepts, right? Maybe you'll have a wonderful, happy life together, right? I mean, that's really, really positive. So maybe you decide to do that, you know, plus a thousand, right? You say, that would be fantastic. And, of course, these are just subjective, and it's up to you how you evaluate the possible outcomes. But the point is, once you've got this, and whether it's for a date or for any other kind of decision you might want to make, once you say, for all the possible outcomes, here's how good or how bad it is, and here's my estimate of the probabilities of those outcomes, then you can compute overall whether the action is a good one or a bad one. So in this case, you'd say, well, on average, if I ask, well, 90% of the time, I'll get rejected, and that's a minus 50. But, but the other 10% of the time, you know, she'll accept, and that's a plus 1,000, right? So if you believe that and you put it together, you average out the 90% of the minus 50 and the 10% of the plus 1,000, that was out to plus 55, which is a positive number, right? Quite a bit positive. So it says, you know, on average, it's a net positive if you take this action, right? So, so if you believe utility theory, you say, well, this, this argument says we should go for it anyway, right? So you should go for it, you know? So now, of course, um, I realize that this analysis can only take you so far, and, and whatever decision it is you're trying to make, you have to assess the possible outcomes and the probabilities, but it's a way to think about it rationally. Other times I found it uh, helpful to think about things that way. So, um, Okay, let me, uh, let me move on. And um, I mean, I want to leave a little time for Monte Carlo, but um, let me just talk quickly about um, coincidences, because that's another thing I get asked about a lot. And... Uh, People say, you know, hey, this strange thing happened to me, you know, I was here, and I, and in fact, I was going on my own that way, and this is very, you know, running into someone, and it's when, um, when I was in my own teens, my family went on a trip to Disney World, we were coming from Florida, we went to Disney World in Florida, and in the course of a couple of days of waiting in line and going on rides and so on, all of a sudden, we ran into my father's cousin, Phil, and he was in Connecticut, right? And we had no idea he was going to be in Florida, and he had no idea that we were going to be in Florida. And we think, my God, that's amazing. You know, what are the odds that we would run into my dad's cousin Phil in Disney World? And we think, you know, how can you make sense out of something like that, right? Because people tend to think, not only is it so unlikely, but also it must have special meaning, right? There must be some reason that I was destined to see my dad's cousin Phil in Disney World, right? So, when you say, and this is something I talk about in the book, boy, you say, well, Let's see, how unlikely was that really? So the first thing we can say is, well, we didn't only see one person when we were at Disney World, right? We spent several days waiting in big, long lines. There was probably a few thousand people that we saw close enough that if it had been my dad's cousin Phil, we would have said, hey, 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 Phil, how are you? So, so the point is, it's not really, you know, first you think it's just, you know, one chance out of, you know, the population of the United States, which then is about 230 million people, right? So I think it's one chance in 230 million. Then we say, well, wait a minute. We saw a few thousand people, so maybe it's a few thousand chances out of uh, 230 million. Well, that's still pretty unlikely. But then you think, well, my dad's cousin Phil wasn't the only person that we could have run into that we would have been surprised to see, right? What about my dad's other cousin? <laughs> or my mom's cousin, or you know, my uncle, or my best friend from elementary school. And you start realizing there's probably hundreds of people that if we'd run into them in Disney World, it would have been equally surprising. So, so then you start putting that all together, all the people that we saw that could have been somebody we knew, and all the people that we know that we could have seen, and you multiply that all together. And in the book I talk about this, and it works out to something like half of 1% chance that if you go on a trip for a few days to a crowded place like Disney World, that you will run into somebody that you didn't expect to see there. 
which is still not that likely, right? But it's not that unlikely either. And then you start to think of a lifetime of all the trips you take and all the places you go and all the clubs you join and so on. You start to realize it's actually fairly likely that at some point in your life, this will happen. As always, I ask crowd, I say, you know, how many people have a story like this? And usually, at least half the audience will put up their hand, you know. And I see some people behind you've had your own stories, right? And so the point being that it's still amazing that it happens, but it's not actually unexpected, and it doesn't necessarily have any special meaning to it. So, okay, so let me um, move on. Um, about the time. Okay, well, I'll, I'll quickly say this. This actually came up earlier today, and people uh, found this. So there's a classic story, and this is again related to surprising things. And this, again, some of you probably know. Um, and it's the issue of if there's a group of people, what's the chance that some pair of them actually share the same birthday? And so let's say there's 40 people at a party. You say, what's the chance that some pair of them have the same birthday? Well, if you haven't thought about this before, you think, well, there's 365 days in a year, and there's only about 40 people at the party, so maybe it's like, you know, 40 chances out of 365 is not really that likely. But it so happens with 40 people at a party, there's an 89% chance that some pair of them will have the same birthday. And you know, it's quite likely. And in fact, you can make a bet the next time you're at a party with 40 people, and you can probably make money, because people will think there's not going to be two people with the same birthday, but in fact, there will be. And why is that? Well, I think the way to think about it is that with 40 people, there's a lot more than 40 different pairs of people, right? And start thinking all the ways you can pair up A with B and A with C and A with D, but also B with C and B with D and so on. There's actually 780 different pairs of people that you can make out of a party with 40 people. So 780 pairs, well, that's a lot. That's more than 365. And that's why it's so likely that if you're at a party with 40 people, there will probably be some pair with the same birthday. And again, another way to think about that is that in general, things will tend to match up more often than we think they will because there's so many different ways you can select things that will match up. So another way of thinking that surprising coincidences aren't always as surprising as they seem. Um, let me talk about one more thing, sort of related to coincidence, but I want to lead it into uh, Monte Carlo, which I'll hopefully have just a few minutes for. And um, this is, I sort of call this, what does randomness look like? And um, this is another simulation. And what is this here? This is just... A simulation which places 10 dots at random on this pink rectangle. Okay? And it places them, each one, completely at random without regards to where all the other dots are. And you can think of this as a simple model, let's say, for particles in a uh, statistical physics experiment or for uh, molecules of gas in a room. But what I want to look at is the patterns that come. So if I press this, hopefully it'll be a new sample. And each time I'm going to press that, it's going to do a new sample, putting these dots at random on this pink rectangle. And why do I want to show you this? Well, there's actually two reasons. The first one is to say that when you look at this, you often find that it seems to be sort of making certain patterns or doing certain things as if there's some forces or some causality on these dots, when in fact, as I've already told you, there isn't. So you know, if you look at this one, well, it looks kind of random, but you know, there's no dots on the whole bottom part, and there's no dots on the whole middle part. It kind of looks like it's broken up into two teams, right? And you might think, well, these dots are influencing each other, but again, that was just completely random. If I do another one, um, okay, the first one, that was actually quite dramatic. Again, it's random each time. Here's a case where nine of the dots are all bunched up over here, right? And again, that just happened. This guy's the loader, right? He doesn't have any friends, right? But, but these ones are all there, and you think, well, there must be some reason. You know, there must be these dots were pushed there, or these particles had some force acting on them. But well, actually, no. And, um, and part of the reason I say this is that this, you think of this as a model for surprising events that will come up in your life. So let's say you, know, you get three wrong numbers on your phone the same week after you didn't get any for a month. Well, maybe it means someone's just published your phone number in the newspaper, right? But maybe it just means there's some sort of a causality thing going on. Not, I mean, there's, not, I mean, there's just a random clumping going on. Um, one time, one summer, I worked at a summer job at a research institute where they hire about 50 students each year. And of the 50 students, eight of us were named Jeff. <laughs> and you think, wow, there must be some reason, right? They were hiring Jeff that year. But it's never happened to me before or since, and so I think it was just another random clumping going on. So anyway, so the more times you do the sampling, you just go, that one actually looks pretty nice and random, although nothing on the side. That one, again, looks a little more bunched up there and completely empty there. Why is nobody over there? Again, it's just randomness going on. So let me, in the last few minutes, just say that um, 
that not only is that a way to think about, you know, how things occur randomly, but also it's a bit of a lead into a quick look at Monte Carlo algorithms, which is uh, the last thing I want to talk about. And uh, so I claim that these dots can also be a way to think about Monte Carlo algorithms, but, uh, you yeah, know, that's great, but what is a Monte Carlo algorithm, right? So that's what I'll, I'll just talk about for a couple of minutes. And um, so you probably know that Monte Carlo is actually a uh, beautiful luxury uh, uh, place in, in Monaco. It's a French protectorate. There are lots of rich people with yachts, and there's a casino and so on. That's not what I want to talk to you about, but uh, that is what these algorithms are named after. And in fact, statisticians being clever people they once organized a conference about Monte Carlo algorithms, which took place in Monte Carlo. So we had some statisticians visiting the casino in Monte Carlo, and if you look carefully, you might recognize that guy there. But uh, anyway, but what I want to talk about now is just this idea is, you know, what is a Monte Carlo algorithm? So, so it comes up in computation. So suppose you want to compute something that's difficult. So there's all kinds of examples, just quickly. So for example, in uh, medical research, you uh, sometimes have statistical data from lots and lots of patients, and they have lots and lots of risk factors, and lots and lots of physical properties, and they take different treatments and different medicines and so on, and you want to try to put that all together. In finance, people want to make predictions for uh, future stocks, or they want to price stock options and so on. They want to do uh, estimation of things. In physics, things about interacting particles, kind of like that picture that we saw. Um, uh, just in numerical analysis, so if you're trying to compute a high dimensional integral, that's something that could be hard to compute directly. In computer science, it comes up a lot. And the point is that even fast modern computers are not quick enough to compute these things. Um, so what can you do? So, so let me just quickly say, so first of all, by analogy, Suppose I tried to think of an analogy appropriate for the state of Minnesota, and I said, suppose we wanted to compute the depth of a lake. I hear you have 10,000 of them here, right? So, so suppose we wanted to compute the average depth of a lake. Well, you maybe it would take too long to try to measure every single inch of this lake. So instead, you could do random sampling. That is, you say, well, we'll move on this lake, maybe the canoe or whatever. We'll compute the height or the depth at these various points, and we'll average it up. So you can think of that as kind of like running a poll. So it's like saying, we're going to do a poll where we're going to, instead of randomly phoning people, we're going to randomly pick spots on this lake and we're going to measure the depth. And just like the law of large numbers, which says, well, the casino is going to win in the long run, or the coin flips are going to be about 50% heads, similarly, if you take enough random samples, you'll get pretty close to the true average depth of the lake. So that's the way to think about Monte Carlo. And then you say, well, what happens in a real problem? Um, so uh, let me just quickly set this up. That, um, so suppose we go back to those dots and we say, um, well, let's just go ahead to try it. So we say, um, what happens with these random dots? Suppose we wanted to, for example, compute, when you put 10 dots in at random, what's the average smallest distance between two pairs of dots? Well, to try to work that out mathematically it would be kind of difficult, and there's harder questions that would be even harder. But if we just sample every time, then we can just take a sample, look, well, in this sample, I guess that's the smallest distance. Or in uh, this sample, well, I guess maybe that's the smallest distance. And in this sample, oh, that one, they're really close. That's the smallest distance. And the point is, if we keep on sampling, and we keep on getting our computer to test what's the smallest distance each time, then we can average that up, and that will give us quite a good estimate of the true average distance. So that's sort of Monte Carlo algorithms in a nutshell. A lot of them get more complicated than that, but I don't have time to talk about them more. But um, you know, the point is, if you do more and more simulations and average things up, you get closer and closer to a true estimate. And that's the subject of Monte Carlo algorithms, which is a huge subject that's used in lots of science. So, um, sometimes it gets more complicated. There's fancier things, Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithms that I work on, which I won't talk about now. But the point is, they, uh, these things come up in other ways too. So, anyway, let me just sum up because I know I'm out of time. But uh, I hope that uh, you've got a sense of you know, that probabilities you know, can, first of all, be interesting you know, of themselves, but also can be quite useful in how they apply to real world things and also to scientific things. Um, so, you know, I mentioned the lobbies, airframe crashes, homicides, casinos, and so on. There's all sorts of ways that they come up in our everyday lives. But also, with this Monte Carlo algorithm and stuff, there's all sorts of ways that science is using randomness in order to advance our frontiers of knowledge and understand how to compute things. Um, so, I think there's lots to think about about probabilities. If you do want to know more, well, as mentioned, I wrote this book, you know, Without Any Equations, it's just an idea of how probability comes up in our lives. Um, but if I am doing a, um, a technical talk tomorrow, so if you're interested in the technical side of Monte Carlo algorithms, 
some of you could consider that. That's tomorrow afternoon uh, in the uh, statistics department. My website has all my articles and these simulations and, and more. So anyway, thanks again for coming. I'll stop there and hope you have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you for a very fun and interesting talk. Um, maybe we can entertain one or two questions. Anything from the audience? students, if you want to have a certificate of attendance, please come on down.